When it comes to understanding free energy, you need to understand the concepts. It's not good enough for me to just sit here and harp at you and tell you, memorize this, memorize that. That won't get us anywhere. You need to understand why is it possible? How is it possible? And the basis of that is where does electricity come from? There's a Veritasium video. And in this Veritasium video, he puts a battery with a switch. And then over here, he puts a light bulb. And he says, okay, imagine wires that go all the way around the earth. And then they connect and they make a, a large circuit. And he says, okay, I'm going to switch on, I'm going to switch on the light. If energy is flowing through the wires, energy has to go at the speed of light through the wires. So the time it takes for the light bulb to turn on should be the distance of the wires divided by the speed of light, right? If the energy is flowing through the fields, flowing through space, <laughs> then it would be the speed of light divided by this distance. What happens when they switch on the light? Light turns on almost instantaneously. Why? Because the power is not flowing through the wires. The wires are acting as a conduit. And the fields are what's carrying the energy. And the fields are flowing directly from the battery to the light. At least in the situation of a design where they're that close together. Where is this vacuum energy coming from? It's coming from the ether. Belief of the time was that the vacuum was a thin material fluid, the so-called material ether, which we know today is false. The ether is there, but it's not the observable material fluid. Faraday had re-established this notion of lines of force, but he thought the electromagnetic field or the electromagnetic disturbances in the ether, so to speak, was really twanging strings. The strings were under tension, and when you had a disturbance, what you really did was pluck the strings. Now, Maxwell states very clearly that he set about to actually capture exactly what Faraday was doing in his lines of force in the theory, and that's what he did. Maxwell's actual theory is 20 equations and 20 unknowns. In quaternions, which is a higher topology algebra, you can do things in that that you can't dream of in doing in tensors. And you certainly can't do in vectors, and you certainly can't do with the theory that's taught at our universities. All that remains to be rediscovered and uncovered. Interesting. I didn't. I, I never fully understood the quaternion idea before. So I guess he's saying that we have to actually look at space-time as a superfluid medium. If we look at space-time as a superfluid medium, then we can use these quaternion equations, and this will help us understand how we can manipulate reality, how we can bend space-time. That's an interesting view. I, I like that. And the ether, I didn't hear it in that particular clip. Maybe the other ones will mention it. The ether is not this viscous fluid. The ether is literally the zero point energy. People say, what is it? It's space time itself. Space time itself is made up of zero point energy. That's what space time is. That's why when you interact with the zero point energy, you're manipulating space time. So how you can pull energy out. It's how you can shrink the distance. It's how you can create a gravity wave using it potentially. It's how you can teleport an object. That's how we have entanglement. Why do people think that entanglement exists? Entanglement exists because of the ether, because of the medium we're in. You couldn't have entanglement in an empty vacuum. That's not possible. How can this be entangled to this if there's no connection? There must be a connection. So what is it? The ether. If you were a fish in the ocean, you wouldn't even think you're in a medium. You don't have context for being outside of the medium. You're always in it all the time. You would jump out of the surface and you would go, I'm in emptiness. I've, I'm in the vacuum. <laughs> When fish jump out of the ocean, they probably go, hey, I'm in the empty vacuum, everybody. And then they get back into the water and they go, guys, you won't believe where I was. I jumped out and I was in the empty vacuum of space. Like that's basically us. We're idiots thinking that 
that outer space up there is an empty vacuum, but it's just another medium. Nature does not insist on conserving energy in three dimensions. We do because we have a three-dimensional mind. We like to think in terms of space because observation itself destroys time and what we look at is spatial. So we like to think the world is made of space, not space-time. However, nature loves to work in four dimensions. Her fundamental law is conservation of energy must apply in four dimensions. Now, you're not going to beat that one, so never think about that. But there is no law of nature that requires you to come in and say, also, it must apply simultaneously in three dimensions. Hmm. If we build some gadget that makes it apply in three dimensions, we apply an extra constraint on what nature will give us. Turning that around, hmm. we go around building things that insist on having this three-dimensional exchange of energy. We've got to put it in in three dimensions for whatever we get out and lose some in the middle. So we, we're... We got a terrible situation all the way. It's called entropic engineering. We always got entropy beating us to death. Never go over unity. Forget it. Lose a lot. We talk about you know efficiencies at thirty percent and so forth for our power systems when we talk about burning the coal and all that stuff. But nature doesn't require you to do that. All you have to do is break a little bit of this three symmetry set of chains where you have tied her feet to the floor. Once you break the flow in three dimensions, you no longer have to conserve energy in three dimensions. The basic conservation of energy is an inflow from four dimensions, outflow in, in three dimensions. From the fourth dimension, in, converted and flowed out into three. And that one is free. Giant neg entropy is free. Nature will start reorganizing a goodly percentage of the whole vacuum for you, spreading at the speed of light, and will continue it as long as you leave the dipole alone. As long as you leave the dipole alone, he's saying that we look at energy all wrong. If you look at energy from our three-dimensional reality and you just assume that you must have a direct connection in your circuit from the power to the bulb, then yes, you're never going to be able to produce over unity. How do you produce over unity in a system like this? You can't. Not possible. Because of entropy because we're going to lose a little bit of efficiency in this system. There's only one possible way to produce free energy. It must be coming in from a fourth dimension, from an extra dimension. There must be an extra input into this system from an extra dimension. Well, who's been talking about that? Kaluza Klein, 1919, 1926. Paper got re like upped basically, got improved, got upgraded to uh, Super Saiyan, so to speak. Kaluza Klein unified electromagnetism and gravity with an extra dimension, the ether, the radiant energy, the zero point energy. Tom Bearden is saying that it's a three dimensional system we can't produce over unity, but that's not how nature works. All energy is coming from the zero point energy from the ether dissipated out into our system, into our reality. That's where energy is coming from. Same as that energy right there behind me. Energy is coming from the ether and eventually goes back to the ether, I presume. Like a giant energy cycle, just like the water cycle on Earth. We use the water up. Is the water gone when I drink the water? Is this water gone when I drink it, chat? Is energy gone when I use it? Of course not. Eventually, I pee that out, flushes down a toilet, probably goes up and uh, as or accumulates in the air, especially on a hot day, and then it rains back down. The water cycle. We live in a giant energy cycle. And so if you engineer your system to incorporate that, you can have a huge neg entropy, an extra input into your system. And then now after that, it's just however good of an engineer you are, sky's the limit on your coefficient of performance. People gave up on magnetic motors because it's just not practical. It's just not practical. What people have been working on is cold fusion. They've been working on plasmoids. They've been working on lattice-confined fusion, various forms of 
uh, Pons and Fleischman, which I don't think are ever going to really get there. Plasma. The Once you realize that space isn't empty, the first thing you realize, I can make a miniature sun. I can make a miniature sun. That's the first thing. You go, oh shit, space is not empty. Then there's no reason why I can't produce this little plasma stable object that's pulling energy out of the vacuum. A new kind of electromagnetics, a third kind, and I have dubbed that scalar electromagnetics. In quantum mechanics, when the electric field and the magnetic field reduce to zero in an area, you still may have the potentials. And if these potentials, which are the real things going on, interfere with each other, you can have real effects still produced in, in charged particle systems, real physical systems. In 1959, a classic paper by Aronoff and Baum in Physical Review pointed this out very strongly. And since then, part of that has come to be called the Baum-Aronoff effect or sometimes the Aronoff-Baum effect. The Aronoff bomb effect. I added it, JK Philly fan, to the Tim Pool thing that I sent to Dr. Yu earlier today. Aronoff bomb effect. It says, wait a minute. I looked at those Maxwell equations that were reduced to four, and it says that there should be no effect if I have like a solenoid that has all the, the fields are contained within my solenoid, my tube. So if I have this tube where all the electromagnetic fields are contained within it and I shoot an electron past it, there should be no effect, right? Because I'm in an empty vacuum. Nothing's technically affecting it. Uh-oh. When we do the experiment, we see a phase shift. How can that be, though? How can that be if there's no electromagnetic fields there? It's just potentials potentials are impacting it but what's a potential what's a potential well i would say that you have basically created a ripple in the ether you've created a ripple in the ether that doesn't care that you've confined it in your three-dimensional space because it's not confined in four-dimensional space this is the same idea as why quantum tunneling works why does quantum tunneling work why, if I put up a barrier, can I, an electron tunnel right through the wall? Why? Because nature doesn't care about our three-dimensional reality. Nature is working in four dimensions. This wall is not really here in four dimensions. Or if it is there, some part of the wave function can get past it. So the ehrenhoff bohm effect and the Lamb shift. Lamb won the Nobel Prize. These things prove we are in a sea of energy. No question, no doubt. We must be in a sea of energy. It's not possible for there to be a phase shift when there's no electromagnetic field unless we're in some kind of medium. Everybody can understand that. It's a very simple to understand concept. The Casimir effect, two uncharged plates, uncharged plates, just neutral plates, they have no reason to come together. The only reason why things should come together is if there's charges that would pull them together, right? A positive and a negative. But if we just put them close together, they automatically come together all on their own. That, again, can only happen if you're in a medium. And we know that medium must be electromagnetic in nature. Everything is a wave. And at the end of the day, we need to think about things in terms of coherence and decoherence. Is it phased in our reality or not? That's really what the double slit experiment tells us. Where something is isn't as definitive as we think. It's more of a matter of our perception of that reality. If we can make this effect exist in the big world, they think it, effect, it exists only in the micro world. We can get action at a distance. That's no longer a dirty word. I'm going to show you how to change the mass and inertia of an object, affect its rate of flow through time, affect the gravitational field, and so forth. You then, you do this by making a zero system. You oppose the vectors so that they sum to zero, but they are still there in the substructure. 
With this simple mechanism, with few coils and transistors and so forth, by making deliberate zeros, we can deliberately engineer the Schrodinger equation, and we can deliberately affect the probabilities of quantum mechanics. The hidden variable theory now becomes directly engineerable. Yes. God, that was so big. You guys don't even know. Oh, my God. That's how we directly engineer the Schrodinger equation. Okay, scalar physics. Very simple concept. Electromagnetism, the equations, the e, the uh, Ma Ma uh, Maxwell's equations would say, okay, if I have two waves, if I overlap them, they're going to cancel each other out. Same reason why this rubber band doesn't go left or right when I pull on both sides. Pulling on both sides is not going anywhere, right? So there's nothing there. The forces are canceling out. There's nothing there. Is that true? If I pull twice as hard, uh, is there still nothing there? It's starting to get pretty tight. I pull a little bit harder, and this rubber band's about to break. So just because I pull equally on both sides doesn't mean there's nothing there. We agree on that. There's stress. There's a stress in the medium of the rubber band. That is still something. It might not be necessarily a large thing to calculate. It may be hard to understand, but it's there. That's the same exact concept as taking one electromagnetic wave going this way and the exact opposite le electromagnetic wave that perfectly overlap, 180 degrees out of phase. They overlap, and then they cancel each other out. They cancel each other out. You would say, well, there's nothing there then. Electromagnetic theory would say there's nothing there. You created a scalar wave, but a scalar is just a magnitude. Yes, it's a magnitude that we're creating in the medium of the ether, the medium of our space time. You are doing something. If you take two out of phase, perfectly powerful electromagnetic waves, you are doing something when you overlap them and cancel them out. You are doing something. And if you take two of those beams, Two of those beams, those scalar beams that are invisible, no electromagnetic wave, and you shoot that, those invisible beams and intersect them, you will get energy at a distance. You will get interference to occur. So those beams that were nothing will become something again. And all it takes to do that, they can make that phase cancellation with a crystal. They can shoot a laser through a crystal and it'll do that automatically. They've been able to do that since like the 70s or 80s. So you can see how this idea of scalar physics, this idea of, well, when we cancel out our electromagnetic wave, there's not nothing there, just like with the Ehrenhoff Bohm effect. When you cancel out your electromagnetic wave, you say, well, there's, according to Maxwell's equation, there's nothing there. Wrong. Wrong. aronoff bohmish effect proves there is something there. And if we can control those potentials that we're creating, we're creating potentials now, just like with the aronoff bohm effect. If we can control that, we can engineer physical reality. We can engineer the Schrodinger equation. We can manipulate quantum mechanics. The next step is Bose-Einstein condensates. The next step is Bose-Einstein condensates. You use frequency, scalar potentials to manipulate the medium to create shapes, shapes in the medium. You're literally engineering reality at that point.